Perfect. And we shall begin with our first presentation. And uh, may I have the PowerPoint, Fernando, please? And well, um, as you know, we are having uh, this uh, presentation, Hearing Loss, a Widespread Disease with Far-Reaching Consequences by Professor Dr. Kathleen Newman from Germany. Please, the, the next one. And uh, I shall read a little bit of uh, her curriculum. Uh, she's Professor of Phoniatrics, Pedaudiology and Otolaryngologist. She's Director of the Department of Phoniatrics and Pedaudiology at the University Clinic of Münster in Germany. She is also a member of the World Health Organization as an expert advice in the Expert Advisory Board. And um, because they are making this work on the WHO program of prevention of deafness and hearing loss. So that's why it is so important uh, to be, uh, to have Katrin uh, presenting as a comet member and also as a WHO officer. She is also officer from this institution, from the Union of European Phoniatricians of the German Society of Phoniatrics and Pediatric Audiology, and also of the German Society of Audiology. She was chair of the Audiology Committee in the, in the International Association of Logopedics and, Pedi and Phoniatrics and the Technology Committee of the Coalition for Global Hearing Health. She is also editor-in-chief of the Journal of Fluency Disorders and associate editor of Communication Disorders National and International Awards, has she also many publications. And of course, uh, she's interested in examination of speech, language, and hearing process with neuroimaging techniques, implementation of newborn hearing screening, that it's very, very important for all the world. And also she's interested in hearing screening for people with intellectual disabilities, uh, language screening for children, and of course also the problems of screening in the neonatal with CMV, with cytomegalovirus. And also she's interested in working uh, very actively in diagnostic and intervention programs for children population. And of course, also medicine in pediatric audiology, nature is one of her uh, themes and the program for children population in medicine in pediatric audiology and treatment and nature of stuttering, signal analysis in voice physiology and pathology in singing voice, and diagnostic and treatment in rehabilitation of children with hearing aids, cochlear implants, and other hearing implants. Uh, she was working with the German guideline on the pathogenesis assessment okay, and hearing yeah. of speech fluency. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Okay, so yeah. let's let's go to this. But this is this is the the way. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, if I would have known that you read this all, I would never have sent my my CV to you. It's, so I I only want to say I'm not uh, an, an officer of the WHO. I'm an advisor in audiology. Uh, Okay, colleagues and friends, it's so nice to see you all. In particular, people which I haven't seen for a long time. Um, somebody should allow me to share my screen. Okay. Share screen, please, Fernando. Yeah, but this is important to say something uh, about all the all your work. This is this is great. Yeah. So no, fifteen minutes for hearing. I try my very best. You all may know that uh, hearing is the most high sense of the, uh, the hearing range of the human ears from about 16 hertz to a maximum of 20,000 hertz, which is a large range. And our perceive the sound uh, it produces power of only of less than 10 uh, uh, to minus 17 uh, power, but in the inner ear, this is very sensitive. And the pain threshold 
is more than 3 million times the sound pressure of this smallest audible uh, sound. One. Hearing is the sense which we, which, 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 which we perceive the sound around us through hearing engage with our environment, communicate with others, express our thoughts and gain education. And all of you probably know the sentence, not being able to, to see separates men from things, not being able to hear separates men from people, which is really true, even if we don't know if Immanuel Kant or Helen Keller uh, uttered this sentence. Hearing loss was the 11th most common reason for disability in 2010, and it became the fourth most common reason in 2013, 2015. How does this happen? The uh, main reason is the growth of the population, but there's also a real uh, increase of prevalence by the aging of population and by recreational sound exposure. At current, globally more than 1.5 billion people experience some decline in their hearing capacity due to their life course, of whom at least 430 million require care due to moderate or severe hearing loss. So you see here the linear increase of prevalence of hearing loss. And this is differently from vision, for example, where many activities reduced the rise of uh, vision impairment. It did not happen for hearing loss. Why? It's still an underestimated health problem. It's the hidden disease. You don't see it. Uh, and therefore, the, uh, low, it has low priority in the society and uh, among politicians and inadequate resource allocation. So we need to change that. Therefore, it is a WHO goal to make ear and hearing care a global public health priority. Um, okay. So here you can see something, uh, some distribution of hearing loss uh, across world WHO regions, and we can see that the lowest prevalence is in Eastern Median, uh, Mediterranean areas and the highest in uh, uh, South, uh, uh, in, in Western Pacific regions. However, also in Europe and America, there is a high prevalence of about 6.2% of people because of age, aging of population, all these populations live there. Nearly 80% of people with, hear, uh, with hearing loss live in low income countries. And the impact of hearing loss on a person is determined largely on whether it is addressed by effective clinical or rehabilitative interventions. Hearing loss um, negative impacts many aspects of our life. Communication, development of language and speech in children, cognition, employment, mental health. A hearing loss causes low self-esteem, is often associated with stigma and can significantly impact families and communication partners. For elderly people, it goes along with loneliness, social isolation, cognitive loss to dementia, depression, less physical activity, falls, and early retirement. The past few decades have seen game-changing advances, in particular in hearing technology, diagnostics, and the use of telemedicine. Um, ear and hearing diseases uh, can now, nowadays identified at any age at, and in any setting. That's interesting. And it can be prevented. Um, if you, uh, if you um, take into consideration that, for in example, more than 1 billion young people put themselves at risk of permanent hearing loss by listening to music at loud intensity over long periods of time by using personal 
um, or um, personal devices. Medical and surgical management, hearing aids, cochlear implants, rehabilitative therapy, sign language and captioning can ensure that people with ear diseases and hearing loss access education and communication. So if you see here the causative uh, factors which uh, cause hearing loss, it starts with genetic factors for syndromes uh, or non-syndromatic hearing loss, uh, for congenital hearing loss, and uh, birth uh, factors such as hypo hypoxia or birth uh, asphyxia, low birth weight, hyperbilirubinemia, uh, prenatal and postnatal infections such as um, meningitis, rubella, CMV, but also other diseases like autosclerosis, work-related autotoxic chemicals, uh, autotoxic medication. We know more than 600 uh, uh, medications which cause hearing loss. Uh, smoking, did you know that smoking causes hearing loss? Uh, otitis media, still a factor in low-income countries. Exposure to uh, noise and loud sounds, nutritional deficiencies, for example, her uh, herbicides uh, put on rice uh, is a causative factor in many low income countries. Age related sensory neural de degeneration is important. But from the protective factors, we have, for example, immunization against. Uh, vaccination against rubella, measles, um, and other diseases, good nutrition, um, um, pro, uh, protecting against head uh, trauma, head uh, uh, yeah, bangs, uh, avoiding loud noise, I, I will um, talk about this, maternal and uh, baby health is important. So we can do a lot. And we know that about 60% of all hearing loss in children already, congenital hearing loss, is, can be prevented. This is really astonishing and we should do more for that. I want to uh, um, uh, focus on only two factors because they affect um, artists, musicians in particular, and are important for us as comment. The one is loud noise, loud sounds, uh, such as occupational noise, recreational sounds, and environmental noise. It damages hair cells and other stru structures within the cochlea. The high frequency range is affected first because it comes first in the cochlea. Uh, where the sound waves travel through. And um, other noise induce health problems such as insomnia or cardiovascular in illnesses are also caused by noise. 16%, uh, that means 7 to 21 across studies and across different regions of hearing loss in adults results from exposure to excessive noise in the workplace. Of persons aged 12 to 35 years, 50% are at risk of hearing loss due to exposure to unsafe safe levels of sound in leisure uh, situations. Can you imagine that noise in sporting events can reach levels as high as 135 decibels? This is like an air, airplane. So, uh, prolonged listening to loud music through personal audio devices with headphones and earphones are um, a, a danger. Listeners who regularly use portable audio devices can expose themselves to the same level of um, some minutes uh, uh, of, of, uh, 
of music at 100 decibel than an industrial worker would receive in an eight hour day at 85 decibel. So four minutes of uh, loud sound uh, through uh, headphones or earphones are enough to, to make an ear damage. But the volume range of a typical listener to a personal audio devices is between 75 to 105 decibel. And in, uh, in particular important are the, uh, the noise peaks or the loud sound peaks, which can um, damage the ear. Okay, among those listeners who frequently visit entertainment venues, nearly 40% uh, percent are at risk of hearing loss. Or if you think of bank traumata, you can see here the typical, typical audiograms with firearms, toy guns, firecrackers, e even um, uh, squeaking uh, ducks uh, make very loud sounds and can impair hearing. Um, uh, have this uh, create this 400 hertz drop and uh, there is also the maximum of the industrial noise and it uh, it touches the region of our most sensitive hearing so what can be protective or preventive factors of hearing loss i uh, mentioned already the immunization but of course avoiding loud sounds and loud noise is important keep noise volumes down keeping the, vo uh, the volume of personal audio devices below 80 decibel is important this can be checked with the use of freely available smartphone apps staying safe is uh, to uh, listen at a volume below 60 percent of maximum uh, uh, which your smartphone allows, allows. Using noise cancellation, earphones or headphones is important. Protecting ears in noisy situations, such as working places, nightclubs, discotheques, bars. Um, the sound exposure can be limited by regularly using earplugs as hearing protection. They reduce depending on the a kind of uh, um, plug, uh, the exposure by 5 to 45 dB. Uh, maintaining a distance from the source of sound, keeping away from loudspeakers, and minimizing the time spent in noisy environments. Uh, the WHO uh, has an ITU a global standard to regulate late, uh, the exposure uh, to loud sounds in, in smartphones. You can read it and find it in the, on the um, WHO uh, website. So uh, to develop uh, and implement a school-based hearing conservation program is important. Uh, countries like Hungary, uh, um, uh, launched um, law for children, children uh, events which uh, uh, regulate the maximum sound levels, which is a great uh, success. Okay, the maximum exposure level for leisure noise is uh, the equivalent of 80 dB for 40 hours a week. And if the sound is louder, the time of exposure has to be reduced. So what's, what can be done um, uh, more? The policies for, policies for awareness need to be uh, active. Uh, it can be like on the cigarette packages or seat, seat belt uh, wearing laws that some, so, uh, some signs are, uh, are on, uh, on, on, for example, tickets for events, sound level limits, as I, uh, uh, as I mentioned, measurement of sounds. For example, in, in the Hunga Hungarian uh, events, children events, uh, 
the measurement of sound throughout the whole event is now law. Uh, provision of hearing protection, dissemination of information and warning messages uh, to uh, regulate quiet areas and sound distribution and management. So, and this can be done by, re, uh, uh, can be filled into programs. For example, in France, physician reported noise induced hearing loss dropped by 17% between 2007 and 2012. So, there is really, really something what can be done. Um, I skip these. Um, points, maybe we come to them later. I want to uh, focus just a moment on uh, factors of, uh, uh, on aging of hearing. What you can see here is the prevalence of hearing loss across ages. And here it starts already at ages of five, 55, 50 years that the prevalence increases rapidly. And um, is higher <clears throat> um, of 50% at ages of um, yeah, 85 to 89 years. And here you can see again the moderate or higher grade hearing loss. Uh, the red column is ages 60 to 69, uh, um, dark gray 70 to 79. Um, the uh, the rose is uh, uh, 80 to 89, already over the half has a moderate or higher grade hearing loss. And then it gets more. So causes are degenerative changes to the structures within the ear associated with aging. Um, and also uh, the neural uh, uh, system, the auditory pathway, uh, undergoes uh, degenerative changes. Okay, so what are the consequences of un- or inadequately addressed age-related hearing loss? I mentioned it already, uh, but did you know that a 10 decibel, decibel greater hearing loss in 60 to 69 year olds goes along with a 50, over 50% 50 greater likelihood of social uh, isolation and cognitive impairment, um, which is equivalent to 3.9 years older age. A 25 decibel hearing loss is equivalent to a 6.8 years older cognitive age. Did you know that? You cannot start early enough with hearing aids. The use of hearing aids and in implants can significantly improve the quality of life. Wearing he hearing aids reduces or cancels the negative consequences of age-related hearing loss. The psychosocial and cognitive skills can be improved and problems of daily living can be solved through better communication. The hearing aid use is associated with increased psychophysiology uh, uh, psychological well-being and fewer symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, there is a good evidence for improvement for cochlear implant fitting as well. However, older people who would need hearing, impair, uh, uh, hearing aids or implants, only a part of them uses them. Uh, in Germany, for instance, less than half, so 40 two to 45 percent. You see here the ages and the green uh, part are the uh, proportions of people who use hearing aids and the orange of those who would need them. And they start too late to use hearing aids. The average age at which hearing aids are first used for age-related hearing loss is high, approximately 70 years in the United States uh, in 2009. How does it come? Because people feel stigmatized. Wearing glasses looks smart. Wearing hearing aids looks old 
making people old. It is still a misbelief. And the hearing loss comes slowly. First, at first, people don't notice them. The others notice that somebody is hard of hearing and say, you, you should speak louder. Um, okay, and the worldwide accessibility of hearing aids and cochlear implants is that only 17% of those who would benefit from hearing aids actually use one. This is also a decreased accessibility in uh, low income countries. So a global a aim of the WHO is within the next 10 years or up to 2030 uh, to increase the uh, proportion of people who use hearing um, um, devices, who have hearing devices and use them by 20%, which is a lot. Okay, and we in Germany uh, try, I, I got a grant to implement a, a program, to, to test a program of um, um, a universal screening for hearing impairment in elderly people uh, combined with hearing and communication uh, therapy and trainings. Okay, I need to stop because it's already long time I wanted to speak about musicians and uh, hearing loss. I did it already. Here are some famous singers, musicians and composers who have hearing loss and many of them uh, had to quit uh, their um, uh, with their musical career. And uh, some of them uh, now uh, uh, warn uh, up uh, coming musicians about noise induced hearing loss and say, I should have protected my ears earlier in my career. So, <clears throat> despite uh, on uh, next to using hearing aids, if a hearing loss starts, uh, what can musicians do uh, to reduce uh, the risk of noise induced hearing loss? They can use earplugs in noisy environments, such as concerts. They can lower the volume of music devices, such, such as iPhones or iPods. Uh, they can use volume, volume limiting audio devices. Many musicians use in-ear monitors, IEMS. These are devices to listen to music or to hear a per personal mix of vocals and uh, stage instrumentation for live performance or recording uh, studio mixing. It's also used by television presenters in order to receive vocal instructions. And it is inserted into the ear canal to increase the signal to noise ratio. Uh, they deliver more signal, that means music, and less noise, for example, from an audience in rock and pop concerts. Um, it does not control only the vo volume, but also the frequency ranges where um, uh, the, the noise has to be uh, decreased and it can be uh, personally fitted to what a musician needs. So these are some greetings from our um, WHO groups and I was um, so lucky to be one of the co-authors of the World Report on Hearing. I have shown it to you and you can download it from the WHO website and get many, many good advices and well understandable also for people who are not med medical. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Catherine. And um, we shall keep on with our program. I think this uh, presentation is uh, very important for everybody because, as we see, each day, each year, it's growing the problem. So in the artistic voice uh, group, like we, we need to be very aware of these problems. So let's keep on with our next presentation. This is the timbre of the voice as perceived by the singer him or herself by Professor Alan Burma from Tallinn, Estonia. 
Uh, he is a PhD a professor at the Estonian Academy of Music and Theatre, where he teaches the courses on vocal methodology, acoustics and hearing psychology. The background of his proficiency also includes electronic engineering and classical singing. So, all together. He has been for several decades the soloist of the professional Estonian Philharmonic Chamber Choir. Alan Burma has won many prizes from some national and international singing competitions, performed some opera roles and given solo recitals. He is the national coordinator of the World Voice Day in Estonia and the member of the editorial board of the journal Musica Sicentia. The last few decades, he has united his competency in singing and engineering by conducting several research projects on the singing voice and its perception. He is the co-chair, and everybody is welcome and invited, of the 14th Pan-European Voice Conference in Tallinn in August. Thank you very much. Let's see the presentation of Alan. Hello. Uh, I want to talk how the timbre of the voice is perceived uh, by the singer, him or herself. Uh, we all uh, have felt unfamiliarity uh, when listening to the recordings of our own voice, especially uh, if we hear it first time in our life. Uh, this is probably caused by different the roots uh, of the sound to the hearing system. Um, it, uh, it has only ear conduction component if we listen uh, to some other other's voice, but it includes also a bone conduction component through the skull uh, and diffracting ear uh, conduction component from the mouth to the ear of the, uh, the singer. Um, there are, have been uh, several attempts uh, to specify the transfer function of our inner hearing. Uh, in the perception tests of uh, Shuster and Durand, the low pass uh, filter speech was considered as most similar to the sound uh, which is perceived by the speaker him or herself. Uh, but the investigators were unable to determine any consistent transfer function. Von and his colleagues used a uh, ceramic piezoelectric transducer, which was attached uh, on the flat region uh, close to the ear of a female singer, and um, uh, they concluded uh, that uh, uh, the speaker's or singer's voice, how uh, he or she perceived it, is a low-pass filter signal with cutoff frequency of about 3.2 kilohertz. Pershman in 2000 uh, measured the transfer function for the direct diffracting um, yeah, component. Uh, he also uh, estimated the shape of transfer function of bone conduction component. Um, in uh, indirect experiment by using the masking phenomenon. Uh, he found that uh, bone conduction dominates uh, between um, the frequencies uh, of um, about 700 to 1.2 uh, kilohertz here. In all those experiments, however, the possible influence of the stapedius reflex, which is also called, called middle ear reflex, was not taken into account. Uh, 
the stapedius muscle in the middle ear contracts on the response of sounds which are louder than about 85 decibels of hearing level but its contraction is coordinated also with laryngeal muscles and the reflex switches in also during vocalization. Therefore, it influences the hearing of the singer, him or herself, but not necessarily the hearing of others at some distance. This stapedius reflex, if it triggers, de decreases the sound transmission to the cochlea mainly at frequencies below 1 kilohertz. Uh, the investigation of stapedius reflex frequency characteristics has mainly been done on cats as it needs an invasive operation. According to Muller, there is good reason to believe that the results obtained on cats may be applicable to the human ear, since human ear anatomy is very similar with cats. In present research, we were trying to check the goodness of seven hypotheses about the transfer function shape, which would characterize the timbre of vocalists' own voice. We did the perception tests where the timbre of short sung excerpts was modified in various ways with the help of graphic equalizer. The experiments was done in a studio with low reverberation, and we had two tenors, three baritones, and three basses as the participants. Each singer had to vocalize the succession of four notes in two vowel variants and and at two voice ranges starting from B flat uh, third octave and from C third octave for basses and paritones and starting from uh, B flat third octave and from E fourth octave for tenors. The singers were asked to try to remember the timbre of their own voice how they perceived it during singing. And the sung experts uh, were recorded to the computer. As a next step, seven timbral modifications of the recordings were done immediately by using the graphic equalizer and computer. In first modification, the transfer function corresponds to that estimated by Birchmann, indicated as B and A, as into account were taken the bone conduction component and diffracting ear conduction component. In the next modifications, um, also, the influence of Stapedius reflex was taken into account. We used random probing and prepared filters, which corresponded to three um, different steps head displacement, either by 36, 44, 
or 54 micrometers. Uh, here also the red curve of the filter um, is a simplified triangular approximation of the curve with 44 micrometers steps head displacement. And the bold dashed curve uh, represented a low pass filter with cutoff frequency at uh, uh, 3.2 kilohertz as proposed in the research of uh, Von at, and colleagues. And the last uh, transfer function was completely flat. It's not here. Uh, representing the hypothesis that there is no difference between how the singer himself or herself and um, listeners outside hear the timbre of singer's voice. We normalize the level of all sounds to avoid possible triggering of stapedius reflex in the case of some louder sounds. We also compensated the inequality of the frequency curve of headphones. Then, all filtered versions of the voice that was sung by the corresponding singer was played him in random order through the headphones at 65 decibel hearing level to avoid possible triggering of stapedius reflex in the listening phase. Now, the participant that is, the singer uh, himself was asked to rate on five point scale the similarity of the presented sound with the timbre, how he remembered it during singing. Participants could repeat each excerpt as many times as they wished and they were also encouraged to sing the excerpts during the listening test in order to refresh their memories. As an average over all test variants, the highest rating got the sound um, in which the transfer function took into account the influence of stapedius reflex at 44 uh, micrometers step head uh, displacement. Also, three other hypotheses got quite similar high ratings. Uh, these are with 54 micrometers step head displacement with a triangular approximation of the transfer function curve and with completely flat transfer function. That is where no filtering was done. The latter case may have been caused by the fact that nowadays most singers listen often to their unmodified voice recordings, which timbre may also seem very similar to them. However, the individual variability of the ratings in the case of flat filter was the highest and included also several very low scores. So the conclusion uh, that we may do is that the difference between the voice timbre as perceived by the vocalist, him or herself, 
and by other peoples does not depend only on different routes of the sound to the hearing system, but also on the change in the properties of hearing system itself due to the triggering of Stapedius reflex during the voice production. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Alan Wurman. This is great to see all this uh, uh, research because it's a very interesting issue to understand or try to understand how is the singer or actors uh, perceiving their own voices. And I may say hello to Ron Scherer, to Adi Primo Fever, George Bollender, Alfonso Borragan, Andrea Ricci Macarini, John Rubin, Sarah and Tom Harris, uh, Dick Stasny, hi Dick, uh, Hermut Bartelt, Peter Hulin, hello everybody. So and, and, uh, I invited uh, on the name of uh, Richard Stasny and, ma and myself, uh, we have a special guest with this interesting uh, proposal and uh, presentation, how it's working and how is the viability of COMET as international artist resource and clinical standard for performing arts medicine practitioners and institutions. May I have the next slide, please? And uh, Jot, uh, Todd Frazier is a composer and director of Houston Methodist Hospital Center for Performing Arts Medicine. He has spent more than 30 years supporting research, education, and accessibility collaboration between education, medicine, arts, and culture communities in America. The center received the 2021 Texas, Texas Medal of the Arts Award from the Texas Cultural Trust. And the spotlighting leaders who fuel the state's economy, improve health and well-being and enrich cultural heritage. And he, he was awarded also by in 2016 by the Luminary Award from the Eastman School of Music, recognizing individuals who have, been, who have given extraordinary service to music and the arts at the community and national levels. Thank you very much uh, for being here, Todd. We listen to you. So Todd is going to share screen with everybody. He's going to talk and then he shall show a small video about uh, his performing art center. Of course, we shall talk about that later on. And all the questions, do not forget, all the questions are going to be uh, at the end uh, in the live discussion, but we shall have 10 minutes after Todd presentation to answer the question, why World Hearing Day Celebration 2022 is important for the artistic voice world. Some of you sent the answer uh, written to me. Some of them uh, are going to speak now and we shall see and hear our Todd. And, uh, and this is important because we are dealing with a, a, a good team work for every uh, performing center. So if we please uh, give share uh, and share screen to, to Todd. Where is Todd? Doctor, but, uh, Dr. Todd is not here. Todd, did you go? Did you went away? Perhaps he has some problems. So let's keep on with the with the question, please. Let's keep on with the with the other slides. We made some tests, so I I really don't understand what's happening. So because of our purposes in Collegium Medicorum Theatre, as we know, of course, uh, we are a group of voice professionals from different cities of the world connected with major theatres, operas and conservatory. And our organization seeks to encourage scientific investigation 
further clinical studies, exchange knowledge and ideas, and develop educational activities in the field of professional voice care medicine. This is in our bylaws. And I bring this, uh, the next one, please. I bring this to you because it is important when we are going to have another Zoom, uh, uh, informal, unofficial Zoom meeting talking about the ideas of making uh, performing centers. It's not an idea that, that we as Comet uh, say that you have to do it. It's only to exchange ideas because our purpose as group is this. And also uh, very important is the exchange, to exchange knowledge and ideas among the members in the forms of seminars or meetings at international conventions. And of course, we have to agree to have also Zoom meetings. That's why it is so important and I keep making pressure on you that you join with us with all these uh, themes that, that we are discussing. And also one of the purposes of uh, COMET since the beginning in the bylaws uh, in 1959 to facilitate the referral of a singer or actor to a well-qualified specialist in another city where the artist is scheduled to perform. That's why um, I think, uh, and of course, we are open to all the ideas in another Zoom meeting, uh, which is your position in your land, in your country, in your office, in your institution, private or public, about this facilitation to, in order to have a group like in, in the Methodist that we are going to see after a while. The next one, please. And uh, because we are waiting for uh, Todd, why is World Hearing Day celebration important for the artistic world? Can we open all the videos, please? And I may read some of the answers, for example, from our dear Eleonora Bruni. Uh, she's not coming with us today, but, and this is uh, what Mexico made about this World Hearing celebration. So Eleonora says the celebration of the Day of Hearing is very important for artistic life and also for voice pedagogy. Precise self-listening allows the artist to have a perception, perception of what he is doing or she is doing. In this way, he can have or she can have a control that is also extremely natural. And it happens in real time during the performance. In, in voice pedagogy, we also educate to self-listening. That's why the, the, the importance of the presentation of, uh, of Alan Burma, because uh, in this way, the singer gets a good natural control of intonation, sound quality, pas passage, etc. For the voice teacher, hearing is one of the main tools to understand what the student is doing to achieve a sound, a vocal quality, to define strategies for improvement. And of course, the teacher's listening is a refined, precise, meticulous listening. It allows to understand what the breath is doing, what the source of the sound is doing, what the vocal tract is doing. In this way, he or she can propose an adequate vocal work. Without hearing, there would be no artistic vocalism. This is the opinion of Eleonora. I don't know if somebody from the participants would like to answer this question or just to speak a little bit about this very important thing. For example, um, Dick, uh, I know in, uh, in this uh, performing group in the Methodist, you also make uh, hearing examinations. So which is your answer to this, to this question, dear Dick? No, you're right. And, and I, uh, to preface uh, Todd's talk, and, and he emailed me, so I know he's, he's trying to get on if he's not on. Um, but Todd is a, a extraordinary young man. He was a uh, undergraduate at Eastman School of Music, and then he got his master's degree at Juilliard in composition. So he's extraordinarily uh, able to, to talk about performing arts medicine. And since the name of COMET is Collegium Medicorum Teatri, not Collegium Medicorum Vocali, 
Um, I think that it'd be nice to, to include all performing artists, whether they're musicians um, playing the violin or they're playing the flute or they're singers or um, actors or actresses. Um, I think it's important to, to have a global organization to cover all those folks. Um, I, I, hearing is, is incredibly important to all of us. And um, we screened the Houston Symphony uh, for hearing and found um, the only significant hearing loss we found in the symphony members were in the violinist and it was their own uh, problem because they caused a hearing loss in their left ear since the violin will put out about 110 dB of sound. And OSHA, which is our government organization that allows you to be exposed to sound, will only allow you to be exposed to that degree of sound for um, 30 minutes a day. And I don't know any violinist that practiced 30 minutes a day. So I, I think uh, that was one significant finding. And then they did a um, study when they did the ring cycle in Seattle. They put uh, sound pressure meters all around the, the orchestra. And even though um, all Wagner operas are long and uh, uh, there's a lot of music, there really wasn't that degree of, of over um, overexposure of sound to the orchestra members. Um, the rock musicians for years have known uh, to protect their hearing. Uh, they um, contaminate the audience's hearing, but they protect their own hearing. And they've gone to Chicago every year to get the musicians' earplugs to protect their hearing, uh, which I think is, is important for them, but it's important on the other side of the speaker as well. Um, but uh, hopefully Todd will be on and, and can talk about the advantage of having... Yes, yes, we are We are trying to solve that. That's why we keep on with the program and so, uh, something happened with the, his internet. He already wrote to me. And I would like to ask uh, somebody else if uh, we, we, sh we have from the audience many interesting, interesting questions and comments. But now we have to focus this uh, few minutes to the answer of why is World Hearing Day so important for artistic voice work? Because I have some other comments that we shall discuss. Please stay until the live discussion. But if somebody else wants to say something about, about World Hearing Day and the connection that's so important for the artistic voice work. Yes, Katrin? Oh, Erika, Erika, please. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say that it's also very important for the posture of the head because if you if your hair doesn't work, usually you stay like this to to listen better from the the good ear. So sometimes I can see my students and they are not like this, but they they stay like this. And I think that it's very important to know. And for a, for a performer, for a singer, to know um, his condition of the hearing. And also, when um, he's doing sound check, uh, to equalize better the voice. Because uh, if a singer can't uh, hear um, low notes, uh, for example, it's very important to equalize uh, the microphone, the sound, uh, to, to perceive better this part uh, of the uh, of the notes. Uh, um, because if you can't uh, hear what, in a good way this part of the notes, I think that uh, you try to push uh, your voice, uh, you try to scream in this part. And so um, if a singer doesn't know uh, his condition, um, it's not a <laughs> good thing. So I think that for, um, uh, for the teachers, for the singing teachers, it's important to, to, to teach this part uh, to, the, to the students because uh, sometimes they don't think it's, it's so important to know if uh, the hearing is uh, okay or not. But uh, I think that it's, it's very important. Thank yes. you. And uh, thank you, dear Erika. And also, Will really uh, wrote to me that hearing is something that I ponder daily in my career as a musician and as a teacher. Without my own accurate hearing, my skills would be useless to the artist who depend on my teaching and guidance. Without hearing assessment and hearing protection, 
the career viability of a performer will be decidedly limited. The ENT, phoniatrician, audiologists are vital partners in our service to the careers of performers everywhere, and World Hearing Day is a very important celebration. So these are the words from Bill Riley. So uh, we have uh, many interesting comments and questions from Peter Hulin, from Liza Popel, and from some of you. Uh, I don't know if uh, some of you want to answer this very uh, precise question about the importance of World Hearing Day, or we, cop we keep on with our program. Do you have something to say, Peter? Uh, Catherine, or shall we discuss after that? We are going to discuss all the uh, uh, pathologies, but now we have to keep on with this question. Yes, Catherine, to this question? Yeah, but we can postpone it to the discussion. I, I can say something, but... Uh, okay, it? if you need to, if, if you want to make a short comment about World Hearing Day and Artistic Voice World. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, how uh, uh, was the World Hearing Day created? Uh, when I was in, in the ILP, we discussed it in the audiology committee that we need more awareness, uh, but not only for, for, for artists, but for, for all people. But in China, there was already a Chinese day of uh, hearing it. It was the 3rd of March. And my Chinese colleague in the audiology committee, uh, who, who was responsible for hearing screening, newborn hearing screening in China, he said, let us propose to the WHO the 3rd of March, then you have already one sixth of the world popu population, which have to celebrate <laughs> this day. And um, yeah, and we, we always uh, see that so much of awareness is necessary. And to point again and again uh, on this uh, awareness issue, we have in the, uh, in the World Hearing Forum uh, a working group, uh, which is only has only to do with um, uh, advocacy and raising awareness. Uh, because everybody is, um, is um, aware of how the other person or ourselves, how we look, how we are dressed uh, and so on. But hearing, you can, you can um, hide it so long also uh, in front of others, in the communication with others, uh, that your hearing is not good. And uh, yeah, and, okay. in, and because it, it takes from the first, uh, from the first beginning of a hearing loss to the uh, uh, to the step that you go to, uh, to uh, seek help, on average there are good studies ten years, and if we arise this awareness and, and save these ten years for um, for artists, that would be so good because they make so much more use of hearing aids if they start earlier. The ideal age would be around 55 to 60 years, uh, and then they take the full advantage. If you start with 70 years, it's over. There are, is so much degeneration already. Okay. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Katrin. Uh, Ron, did you want to answer this question? And then we keep on with the program. I I just know. We sent I another link to, to talk. Yes, yeah. Ron. Uh, this may have to be wait, but I was just going to ask, um, World Voice Day, you know, has a lot of activities in many communities around the world. Uh, does uh, this World Hearing Day also have a lot of activities that are educational that the community uh, learn about? So it's a very extensive worldwide uh, program wise, because I don't see anything in my community. Yes, yes, uh, uh, we have uh, many, we have made many, many years this World Hearing Day is not so popular as World Voice Day. Thank you, Stan, that you sent already the, the web page. And uh, no, of course, as Katrin said, uh, WHO has, and, and of course, many, many persons like Katrin 
have made a lot of efforts in order to make more popular and to make more education through the World Hearing Day. And uh, well, we shall discuss more, Catherine, uh, in the live discussion. We shall keep on with our program now. Uh, can we please put, I don't know what's happening with Todd, but we are trying to solve that. Anyway, we need to, to see Todd <laughs> and to hear him. Okay, so let's keep on with our uh, program. Uh, as, as I said, in Mexico, we also had some uh, short uh, conferences, of course, are in YouTube. The next one, please. And uh, uh, we also pointed out with several infographies to all, all over the places that the, there are special hearing aids or hearing protection of hearing aids for uh, musicians and singers and, of course, they have to be aware of the of the work uh, uh, environment and of course the leisure environment with noise uh, and uh, we made this a small program the next one and of course we also pointed out one very important issue this is the assistance dogs many of you perhaps say you do not know, many persons in Mexico also do not know, that this kind of training of dogs, this is the signal dog. For example, in Mexico, we are training them for earthquakes, for police siren, and for some other noises or alert signals. And now we are going to look at the new member 2022, our dear Liza Pope who prepared a very short uh, video, okay? Hello everyone, I'm Lisa Popeil and I'm based in Southern California near Los Angeles. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to formally join COMET and share ideas with so many wonderful colleagues. Strange to say, I've been interested in singing and speech for over 60 years and I have a master's degree in classical voice. For the last 40 years, I've taught and performed in various styles, including opera, musical theater, jazz, pop, rock, R&B, country. I've been a pianist, songwriter, arranger, and producer. I've made records, and I've performed and recorded with Frank Zappa and Weird Al Yankovic. In 2019, I even got to tour as a backup singer with Weird Al for three months on his 65 city tour. That was amazing, and it also gave me an opportunity to learn firsthand about touring and the challenges of voice preservation. Over the years, my focus has been primarily on looking at the differences between classical and commercial vocal styles. And it's been rewarding to share my life's work, which I call voice works, with other teachers and of course singers in different genres. Since the 1970s, I've had a real passion for voice research and have been able to work with some amazing people in our field. I do hope to continue research into the next decade specifically regarding the mechanisms of belting, vibrato, comparative vocal styles, and vocal registers. Thank you again, Eugenia, for my admission to COMET. It's an honor to be in such illustrious company. I look forward to getting to know more of, about all of you in the coming years. Best wishes. Thank you, Liza. And uh, I would like only to add a little bit of her background. She has a Master of Fine Arts uh, in the California Institute of Arts Major uh, Voice. She has made Bachelor of Fine Arts in 1979 at the California Institute of the Arts in general music, voice, piano and composition. She has studied uh, humanistic psych psychology in the Prescott College and she has been made piano studies and private voice studies. And so this is uh, very interesting because she has been making voice research with many of our colleagues all over the world, comparing classical and non-classical voice technique and multiple in multiple vocal styles. She has uh, been part of uh, and ha has uh, also made lectures, workshops, master classes, and she has teaching experience. Also, she created the voice works method with a comprehensive vocal structure for singing and speech style training and performance technique. Uh, and uh, before we begin with our presentation of our new member, uh, we send already to Todd a new link, 
but he has uh, had some problems with internet connection. So I said to him, don't worry, we shall be here because we have live discussion. So when the moment talk comes, we can include his presentation. And, and this is also our dear Professor Alan Burma with his presentation about uh, his work and his trajectory. I am Alan Burma, uh, Professor of Musicology at the Estonian Academy of Music and Theatre at the present moment. Uh, however, my first education was in radio engineering and I am graduated from Tallinn Technical University. I was taught to construct uh, different electronic equipment uh, such as radio receivers, transmitters, TV and telecommunication equipment. Um, when I was young I was also very interested in singing and I sang in uh, several amateur choirs. In 80, when a young conductor, Tanukaliusta, at this time, was about uh, to establish a new fully professional chamber choir, he invited me to become a soloist of this choir. And I accepted this invitation with a great excitement. With uh, this choir, I could collaborate with uh, many uh, very high level composers, conductors and orchestras. For example, uh, in this picture, you can see uh, composer Arvo Pärt uh, at right and Veljo Tormis at left and behind there is Tenukaljuste and me in white uh, t-shirt. Here is a um, picture um, with Arvo Pärt discussing about uh, details um, in his piece. Um, this, with this choir I also traveled all around the world. This is made after uh, the concert in Sydney Opera House uh, but I have been also in Mexico City, for example, in Japan, in the United States, uh, Canada, China, and in all European uh, countries. Uh, this uh, poster is um, a door of um, a Great Hall of uh, uh, Moscow State Conservatory. And um, I have been also in, in all places uh, of the former Soviet Union. Now this picture is with um, Ivan Fischer, the chief conductor of Budapest Festival Orchestra. Now also, Paul Hillier has been uh, the conductor of uh, my choir. Uh, in parallel um, with singing in this choir, I started to do my second higher education um, in Music Academy uh, in Tallinn and I started to study classical singing. I was uh, quite good. I won uh, several uh, singing competitions. Um, and also I had opportunity uh, to work with ensembles, uh, to do uh, some opera roles, uh, to sing with orchestras, and uh, to do solo recitals. Um, when I, um, when I was uh, singing, I had still several questions regarding the theoretical side and nobody could give me those answers and because of that I started to do uh, also voice research. Um, 
Today I'm retired from active singing, uh, but uh, I give uh, lectures on vocal methodology, um, uh, voice teaching history, uh, on acoustics, hearing psychology, and uh, music uh, psychology. And I am organizing also uh, Pan-European Pan Voice Conference, uh, which will be this uh, summer in August in Tallinn. And sometimes they still ask me uh, to participate um, in projects as a singer. <laughs> Thank you very much for this presentation, Alan. And I think um, this is this is great where uh, some colleagues like you are sharing so much knowledge from art and science. So the next one, please. The next one, the next slide. Uh, well, as as we know, uh, our plan for this year is uh, to have a face to face, at last, we can embrace each other, we can give kisses and see each other and talk and talk and talk. And this is our annual conference program for Tel Aviv 23 to 25. Yes, please, Adi, we hear you. So, hi everyone, it's so nice to see you. And uh, I am happy to say that, uh, or to announce, that we plan to meet in Tel Aviv on the 23rd to the 29th of October. And we have, a wonderful we have wonderful plans to see Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and maybe the Dead Sea. And Eugenia wants to see also Petra, but this is not Israel, it's, it's Jordan. So uh, hopefully I will meet all of you uh, in October and maybe even before in Tallinn. 
So um, that's it. <laughs> Shall we have the other slides? And this is very important because, as, as we know, we haven't seen each other not face to face in Zoom meetings. So this is the first annual conference after the pandemic. And I invite everybody and that we share our knowledge, our experience, but also that we, well, that we share our friendship. So it is, it is not so, so difficult to get there. And uh, well, we shall see each other very soon in this. And of course, Comet has another celebrations. For example, we want to make a special uh, celebration like panel or something for the World Voice Day. Lift your voice. I cannot translate it in Spanish yet, but uh, I am looking for that. And uh, if somebody wants to, to be in this panel, I shall send you the invitation. That means we are going to be in the World Voice Day webpage uh, from many, many lands. I don't know how are we going to, to handle this because usually in the World Voice Day uh, program, it's each country. But because we are international, universal, and from all over the galaxies, we are going to have a special celebration. Also, a big invitation to everybody. We shall have a special session in Pan-European Voice Conference 14 in Tallinn. This is going to be 24 to 27 August, and we have a special session of that. I don't know uh, our technicians if uh, Todd is already there or He's having problems with internet, so it does not depend on us. But as I said, Todd, he can come and share with us during the discussion. I don't know, do you know something, Karen, about uh, Dr. Todd Frasier? No, sorry, he's not here. We not already yet. sent him the, the link, but he's not here. Not yet. Okay, so I wrote to him that uh, he could join us uh, uh, every time we are going to be here and and please don't leave because the questions are really very very interesting this is a comment everybody sends many many compliments to Katrin to Alan and to everybody because we are so close friends but uh, John Rubin says and this is a very interesting comment there is an extremely popular television program in the UK Strictly Come Dancing, and the winner this year is Rose Eileen Ellis, and she is congenitally deaf, and her participation in this competition enormously raised the recognition of hearing loss, deafness in the UK amongst the public. Do you want to add something to, to your comment, dear John Rubin? Hello, everybody. Just to say she's also an amazing dancer. And one of her dances um, that she did, she also had a wonderful partner. Um, one of them, Giovanni, I don't remember his last name. One of the dances she did right in the middle of the dance, and she hadn't told the judges she was going to do this. Suddenly, there was about a 30-second stop of all the music. And they continued the dance. And it was absolutely breathtaking because they stayed perfectly in step without the music uh, just to let the, everybody know what it was like for her uh, and then she went back and then the music came back on and she finished and what they did what they did as a partnership um, is um, they developed a series of blinking so that uh, she could watch Giovanni's eyes so that she, she could keep step with the music Thank you. Really quite Thank you. And, and also, I would like to say, uh, because uh, some of you have to leave, uh, the situation now, if, if I may have the, the last slide about the program for, for Comet, please. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, and the next one. So please do not forget that our uh, idea is to have on 7th May, so we have already the dates fixed since last year, 
with behavioral issues and artistic voice users, and 9th July, surgery and rehabilitation of artistic voice. But uh, please do remind that uh, you can uh, send some proposals for the last two Zoom meetings. What is the future? Well, we think about Tel Aviv annual conference face to face, but uh, we have still to work in this Zoom meeting. So everybody is invited to send some of their proposals. And it is very important that all, all our COMET members come to the meetings because we have the chance to exchange ideas. And because it is Saturday, even though the families are complaining with us, uh, but we, we can share uh, in a live discussion as long as we need, and, and this is a great opportunity. And the, the last one, please. We want to say uh, to everybody, thank you very much. It's uh, our uh, session to end, but you are really invited to stay here with us. Stand, don't go away, because I have a question for you. But anyway, and Adi had to go. She, she says bye-bye. And now we have videos open. And uh, well, it's, it's interesting. Um, for example, I don't know if Dick can add something to this uh, comment of John Rubin and also Catherine, because as we know, and of course, Alan, you are invited to also to, to answer this uh, question of me. How is it possible sometimes for the deaf persons or the hearing uh, problem persons to dance with the music in itself, but the rhythm and everything. So, uh, Dick Stasny, you have this uh, uh, experience in the Methodist Houston Center per Performance Center. R. Do you have something to comment about the situation, Dick Stasny? One of my greatest heroes is uh, Ludwig von Beethoven, because um, he wrote Beethoven's Ninth Totally Deaf. Uh, and it's paced beautifully, and the vocal music was gorgeous to go with it. And he had no clue. But music um, and dance probably exist in the brain. And so even if the hearing mechanism doesn't work correctly, as in Beethoven's situation, um, the, there's music memory in the brain that enables him to create this absolutely gorgeous music that he couldn't possibly hear. And so, uh, we're, we're going to do another, uh, with the Houston Symphony, we're going to do another talk about um, Beethoven and his hearing problems um, and uh, how that affected his music. And it just got better uh, with his hearing loss. So my, my, it, it's people can overcome a lot of things like the dancer that couldn't hear but stayed on beat with the music. Um, it, it, it's astonishing. And uh, uh, the the... People that play the uh, instruments, uh, many times the professors at Rice University will have his students, uh, the, the horn professor, will have them go out and sit under a tree in the yard and play their instruments by looking at the music and not even having the instrument there. Um, because there's a lot of mental work to, to playing. So there's a lot we don't understand. And I applaud you for, for trying to uh, lift the veil of shadow over this, uh, hearing is incredibly important to all of us. And um, so I, I, you know, I, I applaud the World Hearing Day. I think it's a great idea. This is, this is great. Well, Todd is already here. If uh, you tell us, please, Karen, if Todd is ready. Yes. OK, so sorry to interrupt you, but we keep on with these interesting questions and comments from from uh, Peter and John, and let's hear now Todd at last, but not at least at last. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I thought it was just me, but my whole neighborhood is, uh, the AT&T is down. <laughs> so you can see I'm actually outside in the middle of the, the the trees using my cell phone signal. So I, I won't be able to play our uh, artist health video, but I'm happy to send everyone the link. It's a new uh, 
uh, video that we produced at Methodist that I, I wanted to share with you today that uh, profiles our artist health uh, system. Uh, but really, my presence today was uh, comes out of some conversations I've been been having with with uh, with Dr. Stasny on um, the idea uh, of a sort of an institution stepping up to be an international resource for artist care. And we thought that COMED may want to consider this uh, as an umbrella inclusion to a list of individual practitioners all the way up to large institutions that might meet certain uh, certain uh, standards such as academic and experience, uh, ethical and professionally that could be set by COMED uh, could be could start with a voice only but expand to other artist health resources. And this uh, information um, could be shared in a very user friendly way on the COMED website. The idea of, a, of an expert provider portal, if you will, where it could be searchable by region and even health specialty or both. The idea is that the main benefit for artists and arts or access to an internet list of artists health providers that they can count on and look to as the gold standard. So a little bit more about what this could look like um, if Comed was interested in in being that uh, sort of parent umbrella, um, you would you would need to probably assign someone or create a subcommittee to look at uh, developing what would the professional and experienced standards for inclusion on this list look like. Uh, either the same group or another group would consider uh, how the opportunity might be shared or publicized uh, amongst the members and outside membership. Uh, what this might look like on the COMED website, for example, uh, I have experience in um, <coughs> building a site uh, here where you could actually search by region and specialty and it would filter uh, sort of the approved uh, or the vetted providers that might be closest to your neighborhood. Certain things, of course, basically like the provider name, the contact information, the background, their specialty, and even do they have capability for telemedicine? Uh, are they able to share educational information or videos and some information as well, uh, practically about pricing and insurance and that kind of thing? I think a group would also consider um, <clears throat> consider uh, what if, if, if an individual practitioner or institution was vetted and, and on this list uh, as an as a uh, as an approved provider uh, what they might agree to you know that there may be for example at our center here all of our roster they agree to try to see the artists within 48 hours uh, a group of them agrees to see a certain number of artists who may not have insurance. Um, uh, and also, if uh, a benefit, particularly for both COMED and the artist, I mean, the uh, practitioner institution could be if they sort of met a certain standard of, of artist care and are on this, uh, this uh, preferred list, uh, they might be able to also use the COMED logo uh, on their own side as a way to to further brand it as you know what we would hope to be is the gold standard uh, for for this arena so some of the other educational things that could come out of it is the the providers that were on this list we talked about each year at the comed um, conference we could almost do a grand rounds throughout the world uh, maybe selecting individuals from the different regions to present uh, cases and talk about how you know being on the list and knowing other uh, uh, practitioners that have similar interests has have helped them or they've coordinated with each other or how we've been able to use it to refer patients in different parts of the world we would really use it as our Houston Grand Opera artists were traveling around the world it would really be kind of a central point 
to go to if they were having challenges or troubles. So it's an idea that uh, Dr. Stasny and I uh, really actually had considered for, for a while that our center step up and, and create uh, an umbrella for this list, but we really thought you know, COMED, COMED would really be a better organization if they were interested because they're a national organization. They have the expertise in-house. Uh, they are a gold standard uh, in the industry. And the idea is that I don't think it would take too much manpower as far as a staff person because it would really just be a, a, a reference portal on your website that would be a regional listing of providers that the organization has have deemed um, to meet certain standards. So the artists and arts organizations could be comfortable uh, sending patients to those groups. So that's really, I'm just presenting this as an idea and I think uh, the organization is going to meet just uh, several weeks from now to see if this is worth, you know, maybe putting a small subcommittee together uh, to explore uh, what it would take and what it might be uh, for COMED. So I just, I'll send you the link of our, our video, but that's what I was going to present today. Thank you very much, dear Todd, and uh, we are uh, ready to, to see your video through our web page we can send to, to all our COMED members. And I want to tell you, COMED members, that uh, I organize for 26th of March, to have an informal Zoom meeting for the COMET members who are interested in exchanging ideas of this proposal. And I thank you very much, uh, dear Todd, for this effort. And our dear Dick, I thank you also very much. And I think this is one of the, two of the purposes of Collegium Medicorum Teatri, to exchange this knowledge and experience through all the international situation, but also to have a referral for our actors or singers in, in, in another more uh, universal idea. But anyway, this is, these are one or two of our purposes. And, uh, well, I don't know if you want to make some comments about that, Dick, you wanted to say something? You know, Back, uh, I've got historical memory of uh, Comet because Jim Gould got me in it um, 45 years ago. Um, and back when Jim Gould was alive, he had a nurse named Kathy Goldstein. And people would call Kathy Goldstein from all over the world, from Cairo, from London, from Paris, from Tel Aviv, and say, who do you go to uh, for uh, medical care in this city? And she'd give them a name. And so I, it, I think it'd be wonderful if this umbrella organization, COMET, served that purpose. And no matter where you are in the world, you'd have access to people that really cared about performing artists, whether they're vocalists or musicians or dancers, uh, care about all performing artists. Thank you. That's Thank you, Vic. Well, I wanted, before he leaves, I want to ask Alfonso Borragan from Santander, Spain, uh, which is uh, his experience because, in, uh, as you know, in Spain, we had a different kind of uh, music and we have different, uh, another very special and, and very lovely and exciting uh, hondo singing style. Alfonso, I don't know if you can make some comment about the hearing situation and the singing situation with the zapateado, with the tapping and things in uh, in Spain, please. Uh, I am not a, in in this area, and uh, in all the Spain, it's not normal to to sing uh, flamenco. Uh, the the flamenco is more in the south. Uh, in, in the north of Spain, when I live, it's not normal. Uh, I but. I like very, very, very much the, the flamenco. I listen to a lot of flamenco, and I see some patient with with uh, this kind of or style of of singer. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a it's a question that I don't know uh, a, a, a precise as 
but it's interesting. It's very interesting to connect the sound with the uh, hearing loss. But I don't know, Eugenio. Because what I have seen in another um, singing situation, and, uh, and uh, of course uh, uh, with musicians like mariachi, like we know the mariachi is a, a big uh, a musician group. Almost all of the mariachi sing also like choir. Some of them are solo soloists, but also there are singer soloists with the group. So this is a very uh, hearing, a big, a big hearing problem, because if the singer is in uh, very close to the metals, to the trumpet uh, or whatever, then they have more tinnitus and more hearing problems. I don't know is if somebody from the audience has this experience with the orchestra musicians, because uh, these these are a lot of complaints, mainly tinnitus. I don't know, Alan, if you can explain us a little bit of uh, your research uh, in uh, direction of the bone situation of the bone conduction of uh, of hearing, Alan, and dancing. Um, if you mean. Why, why dancers um, who are deaf uh, are able to be in rhythm? Uh, I think um, uh, very um, important is also information um, which is uh, tactile, so vibration. Um, so uh, so uh, uh, you, you still feel with your body and and also visual information because because uh, how we perceive word um, it's uh, the input comes from all uh, our, our senses and our brain actually puts together uh, the, the whole picture so so what is uh, what is the, the reality and and even if something is missing such as uh, your your ears are, are not in good condition, uh, your other senses uh, compensate uh, this. Yes, yes, uh, we know we know that, and uh, this is something very important for our group to have this uh, um, clear situation about, for example, what Jorn Rubin said about this this dancer, but also about. Uh, 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 the great, great Beethoven, what he felt about that, because John is uh, writing about the pages. Uh, sometimes in, in the history of uh, Beethoven, they said that uh, perhaps it was a pages problem or a middle ear problem. Uh, I don't know, it was a, a very big discussion about the situation. I don't know, Catherine, if, if you can say something about uh, this uh, a bone conduction and also what happens with the with the central nervous processing because we know Beethoven had this this uh, special feeling and special talent of uh, his brain not only hearing <laughs> yeah um, at first uh, uh, only very few people have uh, uh, who are deaf have absolutely no residual hearing. Uh, many of them have this so-called left corner uh, audiogram, where you have in the low frequencies, that means on the left corner of the audiogram, still some residual hearing. That's what uh, John mentioned. And um, I agree with Alan. I, I, I also did uh, some neuroimaging in people with, uh, who are cochlear implant candidates, and we um, stimulated um, the ear and, and uh, in the low frequencies around 63, 120 hertz, um, they were often unsure whether this uh, is hearing or some vibration, some buzzing that was not clear to them what they sent. In fact, they have um, activity, a higher activity of somatosensory brain regions and even fibers growing into the um, 
auditory cortex, fibers from visual cortex and from somatosensory cortex, growing into the temporal cortex um, and overtaking some compensatory functions. And vibration, somatosensory sense is something what they still feel, what is not feel, what is not impaired. And uh, we have uh, dancing groups in our cochlear implant centers uh, because they like uh, the, the rhythmic um, uh, movement and, and, and dancing, and they feel the vibrations of the floor. And that's very important for them to, to manage dancing. Yes, thank you. Yes, Alan? I have one, one uh, more comment on that, actually. Um, on um, opera stages or, or, or when you sing with orchestras or, or with uh, other soloists. Uh, sometimes uh, there is so great masking of your own voice. So, so singers uh, need not to hear uh, um, at all uh, his or her own voice because um, uh, the sound around is so so loud. So, so uh, we, we must understand that uh, the life life of singer so um, from where uh, he or she gets information uh, th there are a lot of things uh, so so uh, th there are um, only some glimpses of of rea reality uh, which uh, singer uses uh, uh, and uh, and also also the memory uh, how how it feels to sing what is correct note i i, I sometimes i'm i'm not hearing at all my voice uh, on on big stage uh, at least it's it's my experience uh, being on big stage yes yes this is very important also because um, I was going to ask about the feedback that the singer, the, he the hearing feedback that the singer needs, for example, in different environments, like in the open air or with a bad acoustic rehearsal hall or with the opera house that uh, do not have a very good acoustic situation. I can remember when we went in a trip with Comet and we visit the house of uh, one of, of the small theaters that was built from uh, Giuseppe Verdi and the acoustic was perfect and it was built at uh, the end of the 19th century and I don't know my impression of the new opera houses or the theaters is that sometimes the acoustic is not so good for the boys I don't know, Ron, if you have want to comment something or Alfonso, Soledad, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ron. Um, yes, this has been a really very interesting day. I really appreciate the fact that we're talking about hearing. I've always had the following, following question. There are so many, many wonderful singing teachers who um, are older than say 60 or 70, and even up to about 100. And I always have worried about how well they can actually hear their students. And um, now in the studio, if you're only three feet away and you're blasting away, well, the hearing curves, you know, rise. And so maybe that's, you can hear, you know, the singer's format and things like that, but from a distance it might. So my question is, have, has there ever been a study on the hearing acuity of older singing teachers and um, have anybody has anybody paid attention to their hearing needs yes alan so um uh, i i think um uh, if you are young um your uh, hearing range is from uh, about 20 hertz to 20000 hertz um, if you are older, it decays, yes, but um, uh, for singing, uh, so, so singing voice, main information is actually below 5000 hertz. Yes, consonants, uh, they may have uh, energy also at higher frequencies, not say 8,000 uh, 8, and, and so. so uh, 
my uh, my opinion or my comment is uh, yes there is of course uh, presbycusis uh, but uh, uh, th this is not so big problem if uh, it's uh, normal presbycusis because uh, the information that uh, voice teachers need need is uh, at lower frequencies Yes, so voice is maybe less bright, but you are used to that change how you perceive voices. So I think that it's not so bad a problem that you may think. Thank you, Alan. Catherine, Catherine maybe have you? No, may I ask, may I, before Catherine, may I ask Lisa what does she think? Because she's also. Uh, making all these uh, voice I have teaching all these ideas i wanted to, to share with you as they they came up so if i could just throw out a, a, a few ideas i uh, ron i think there was i i don't know if it was at a nats meeting or if it was a voice foundation where there was a, they were trying to sign up uh singing teachers over the age of 50 to be willing to do a hearing test and to fill in a questionnaire to say, you know, to be honest, do they notice that? Uh, but uh, but I, I never saw the results uh, from that. Uh, one of the other things I noticed was when, um, when I was younger, um, I noticed that my hearing, my high-end hearing became painfully acute premenstrually. And I thought I, thought I couldn't trust my ears. Um, it, th um, high, certain high frequencies hurt my ears and high volume hurt my ears sensitive. And I realized in my 30s that I could never be a full time record producer because I couldn't trust my ears. So there's and I don't know if anyone's done any research on how how uh, hormonal shifts, I guess, or, uh, in this case, estrogen droppage might increase. It wasn't tinnitus, but it was um, a painful uh, inability to trust my my ears for several days before my period. Uh, that would be an interesting questionnaire for uh, someone who's I forgot who's been involved in in uh, female hormones. The other thing I wanted to throw out there for World Hearing Day was that as a, a, a singing teacher, if I if I t I have my little ways of testing people's hearing to see not which frequencies they, they have trouble hearing, but if they have a, a one ear or another, um, as Erica B uh, Biavati said, you know, sometimes you can see that, but uh, sometimes you can't see a head twist as a determinant if they have a hearing loss. But if they have a pitch problem, I do a little test with cupping of the ear to see which needs help, basically. And so I have never in, in over the years found a student who took their their hearing problem uh, took it further N none of them went and had their hearing checked at my recommendation N they forget about it and so uh, it, it, it's it's a kind of a laziness um, or a lack of sense that it's a real problem and they don't seem to care that they're kind of out of tune because of, they're not professional these problems these ones are professional some think they are very close to a professional pop career and they have no idea that they can't really match pitch well but here here's my suggestion it'd be so great if if we could if we could reach out to companies there are a few companies out there in fact i i just googled on amazon i have two two links of companies that make uh, almost invisible, there it is, two, two different links, for in, semi-invisible hearing protectors. The first thing would be to protect their hearing and to have it conveniently for women in their purses or guys, you know, just to have it. So if they're at a noisy restaurant, oh, I have, I can put those in my ears. I feel like we need to make it easy for them. If we had special wholesale prices or special some kind of business deals with companies that make these so that we can make them available for our clients at low cost maybe you know at, a, at our cost maybe instead of being 17 dollars retail it could be 10 dollars 
that we pay and then we charge ten dollars for them to have it. I find that my students, if, if they, they pay ten dollars for a lax box tube, they're more likely to use it than if they have if I send them the link, they won't follow through. Very you know, one out of fifty will follow through. But if we can somehow have these arrangements with these manufacturers um, to promote their work and to have these to make it easy for our clients, either free or low cost. I don't know quite how to do that um, as a group, but again, my, my experience has been that people will not follow through because they don't think it's a, their hearing loss is a big problem. And if we can make it easy for them or inexpensively easy for them, that would be great. Thank you, thank you, dear Liza. Soledad, do you have something to add as uh, in, in this voice teaching uh, singers, actors? Thank you, Eugenia. Um, very interesting what you are sharing with us. Um, uh, I found most of the problems on hearing lost in classical um, singers and rock singers also. In classic, more in soprano, especially uh, soprano leggere or coloratura, uh, very acute, and also in, in rock. But the difference was that the, uh, the hearing loss uh, in classic singers uh, it was uh, supplied or with the focus activity. In rock, it's a little bit uh, difficult to, to work, uh, but in, in classic music, it's, it's a little bit easier. That was is my experience. Yes, what I, what, I, what I have seen, and I have done that many years ago, I began because uh, I was trained also as audiologist in Mexico. Uh, the medical specialty is phoniatrics and audiologist, not technical audiologist, but uh, medical audiologist. So I, I make all the time hearing tests to all my patients. And I have noticed, for example, in singers that have allergy and that have uh, turbinates very, very grown, very, so hypertrophy of uh, inferior turbinates, and also they have some problems in Eustachian too. They ha are having also problems by singing they, because they are not matching properly the tones or the scales, or they have some very low uh, in, the, in, the, in the pitch and uh, very, uh, uh, how do you say, how, uh, obscure, so dark. And also you have problems with the low frequencies because of the middle or problems. Even though the patient does not complain, they say only sometimes it's not working properly, my pressure in my ear. So uh, what I think is that we need to make hearing tests more frequently to all our musicians and singers. And also uh, this is another issue hormonal cycle, how does it uh, affect the proprioceptivity in one side and the hearing in the other side? Because if we have in the hormones problem, we have this very, very tiny, low frequency, 25 dBs loss or something like that, temporary, we are having some problems by singing also. Yes, Dick? Lisa describes uh, laryngopathia premenstrualis pretty well. And uh, we worked with some OB-GYN doctors with our Center for Performing Arts Medicine in Houston. And we started regulating um, female performers, so that um, vocalists particularly, so that when they perform, uh, they didn't have a menstrual cycle. In Europe, they used to uh, excuse people three days or four days before the menstrual cycle. And it'd be interesting to do a study on hearing and the menstrual cycle and look and see if the edema and the, uh, and the uh, vascular engorgement that occurs right before the menstrual cycle uh, affects the hearing as well. And so I think it'd be a great study to, to add uh, if somebody got an institution that could do that kind of a study. Um, yes. 
it's a well-known phenomenon and we've tried to fix it in Houston by saying, okay, if you're not performing in June and you're not performing in December, that's when you're going to have your cycle, but you're not going to cycle every month. Yes, <laughs> you're right. Yes, Catherine. People could perform and not have that, that uh, problem uh, for 10 months out of the year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dick. Hey, I just want to, to read, even though Peter Hulin is not there, but he asked to Catherine, of course, many congratulations from everybody here, Catherine. And, uh, well, how can it be technically achieved that classical singers have more success in using hearing ears? Are there any kind of, uh, let me see, are there any kind of comments from you, Catherine? I guess I, I, yes. I guess I brought a long comment to everybody. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I want to, I want to to tell you about Petra because it was a, an interesting question, and then we got to the other questions. Yeah, we got to the other questions, but uh, I, I want to to, to uh, reply to Alan uh, Alan's uh, uh, um, argument that high frequency hearing loss should not be. Uh, or, or, is not such a problem for, for, for singers because they don't need them so much. No, in fact, it is not the main problem not to hear the frequencies about uh, 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 over 10 kilohertz or 8 kilohertz. However, the problem is the nature of, a, of an inner ear hearing loss with the nonlinear trans, uh, formation from the uh, uh, from the uh, mechano uh, electrical trans transduction and the transmission to the brain, where you have a reduced dynamic. Uh, so uh, you hear soft sounds, don't hear them or hear them worse than, than others, but loud sounds louder. And you have this uh, smearing effect of uh, frequencies due to loss of uh, the active contractile functions of the outer hair cells and also this function of the inner hair cells. And this makes uh, this feeling unsecure, what, what Lisa described. Uh, you can't trust your hearing. Uh, you, you have this um, recruitment phenomen phenomenon. Uh, if where a, a small, dec a small increase in loudness is a big increase in uh, in sense loudness, where you feel unsecure about intonation, where you feel unsecure yourself in the middle of other uh, musicians. How should I fit to to him or to her? And this is the problem you can't really good solve with hearing aids. They try more and more to get uh, to to make scene analysis. Uh, of the of the uh, auditory scene, and that's what I wrote. Nowadays, good um, offices of acousticians they uh, um, simulate situations like sitting among other musicians or sitting uh, in a in a concert, sitting in an orchestra, and then they fit the hearing aids. And this is the opposite of over the counter hearing aids, cheap over-the-counter hearing aids where you don't have such things. And you should try at least two or three kinds of hearing aids and also of, of ear protection plugs because they change so much or they, they um, are so uh, different in sound properties. And what likes me doesn't like you. and so that that has to be done, and so it it will probably Lisa not be the cheapest <laughs> option to make a good fitting. Of that. Uh, not a problem anymore. <laughs> yeah. Plus, okay. I'm on hormones, hormone replacement, so I'm even. So hearing's fine. <laughs> So, and may I ask, yes, Ron? Um, getting back to uh, one aspect of uh, premenstrual, is 
For carrying in general, our uh, vessel dilatation aspects, they affect hearing um, just because of the blood supply to the hearing mechanism. If that is a little off in some ways, will that affect hearing? Patron, maybe you know the answer to that. Somebody wants to answer? Yes, Honestly, I, I, I didn't get it. Could you could you repeat it for me? Because the uh, the sound quality of my talking about hearing laptop is <laughs> virtual yeah. hearing is a problem. Nobody, none of us can hear anybody on this panel, so it's a real problem. No. So my question was: In general, does vessel dilatation affect hearing? Um, which was that part of the premenstrual aspect. Um, but in general, if, if you have vessel dilatation um, and there's a lot of vascular supply to the hearing mechanism, I assume, any effects there that are deleterious? Uh, well, what, I, what I was thinking is uh, usually, for example, in the premenstrual uh, time, we do have more vascularity all over the, all over the body, yeah. and because of the situation, mainly nose and Eustachian too, that can be a, a small problem. I have heard that, but I haven't studied that very clearly because sometimes the audiogram is correct, is normal, but the the proprioception of the hearing is different even though she or he is normal in this case she so what i think is perhaps uh, it can be through a questionnaire and and to see exactly in the music range what is more difficult for the for the singer uh, in the premenstrual time or in the menstrual time also because there are also uh, in the menstrual time, I have seen in many singers that they are weak in the in the in the pitch. They are weak in the volume, and they are they are weak in the in the in, in the frequencies. So they they don't match so perfect. That's why they feel so unsafe. And and this is every month. So my thinking is that they have to be trained during these these days, but also to be tested in the proprioceptive. Thing because the central processing helps a lot, as we know. Yes, Katrin? Okay, so if we if we share this, this question, for example, about hearing aids, because I usually recommend to my to my musicians or singers that they can try some of the in-ears hearing protection, mainly musicians in orchestra or of course in groups, rock groups or uh, folklorical groups like mariachis. Uh, but also they sometimes they do complain that, that they cannot uh, be in an orchestra playing properly because of this protection. I don't know what is the, the world situation now about that, Catherine, because in one hand we need ear protection, but on the other hand, they need to be in a, in a teamwork with the orchestra, the musicians or the singers. As I mentioned already in my comment, there are now good uh, hearing aids which have both functions, suppression, noise suppression, and also, uh, yeah, bang suppression, if, if there comes a, a impulse noise uh, they are still quicker in suppressing this sound uh, so, so they suppress sound from the environment on the one hand and they attenuate uh, other sounds which are voices for for example but uh, yeah in, uh, hearing aids become more and more uh, they change to also they change their names to hearables or wearables with much more <laughs> function than only uh, um, attenuating sound. And um, 
they communicate uh, both sides and so on. And I guess if they, if they make the online scene analysis better, and this is what uh, all the fact manufacturers are working on, very advanced is, for example, FUNAC. Um, the better uh, the, the acoustic scene is understood, the better this uh, uh, interaction between damping and attenuating is will be managed. But it is still a technical product. Yes, I, I used to make in a voice rehabilitation program, I used to work uh, with masking, with masking uh, as natural as possible, but sometimes during the voice therapy or the voice training, we use some cottons, and sometimes we use cottons and music, and at the same time, the patient is doing vocalizing exercises or uh, voice rehabilitation exercises, because I want to simulate that you have noise in the environment when you are talking, like teachers, this boss from the, from the school, room or when you are singing and, and there are some other uh, noise problems. So what I, what I am trying to work in this rehabilitation is central processing and also proprioceptive uh, uh, stimulus in the voice. Of course, we have also at the same time acoustical analysis. So the, the patient uh, and the singer can see the different changes in the, voc in the uh, acoustical analysis and also feel, not hear, but feel the, the voice, what they are doing. And, and then at the same time, we record the exercise and then we discuss the exercise. So they don't hear themselves, they feel themselves, they, they have the vision of the acoustical analysis and at the same time, we record their voices and then we discuss because we have to simulate this noisy environment. And well, I think even though it, uh, as Lisa said, it is a, a economical problem, but we do need to, to advise to the musicians and the singers to take care of the hearing and also to the big population because the big population is on the very noisy environments and I have many patients, very young persons, 20, 25 years old, and they have already tinnitus. And when they are singing, it is a terrible situation because they have problems in order to decide and to take away the tinnitus. I don't know if you have in your groups, Katrin or uh, Alan, Liza, Ron, and, uh, and Soledad, if you have some of these samples, singers with tinnitus, which is your, their experience. Catherine? Yeah, because uh, the tinnitus has not one ca cause. Uh, sometimes it comes more from the inner ear. Sometimes it com comes more from the central auditory system, uh, which uh, uh, does a kind of over... Or, 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 or the, the in, yeah, or, no, the inhibitory systems do, do not function well, and so is uh, Übersteuerung, wie heißt das auf, auf Englisch? Übersteuerung, uh, what, what we have sometimes with the microphones. Um, uh -huh. Over, over, overloaded, no? No. Distortion? No. <laughs> How do you say in German? Distortion, uh, yeah. Distortion. Übersteuerung. Um, I know the word. It, it yes, distortion is okay. Later. And so, sometimes it helps uh, the singers to sing, to get, uh, to, to suppress or don't hear their tinnitus. I sent you two comments of two singers who both have famous singers, just in the, in the chat, who both have tinnitus. And one had to quit due to the tinnitus, his career, and the other one says this is the only way to manage my tinnitus, uh, that I avoid silence and sing and and so, uh, and this is what I I, tra I trainer also a cochlear implant center, and we always have the hope 
if people get, get cochlear implants, that their tinnitus, if they have some, disappears or get gets uh, better or gets uh, uh, softer. But we have some in which we um, uh, increase the tinnitus and some in which we decrease the tinnitus. And uh, what is usually done in tinnitus retraining, which is also one of the treatments with help, we, uh, give them a noise in, in, the, in, in their noiser. Uh, and this noise is so uh, designed that it should interfere with the tinnitus. And this makes the tinnitus somewhat softer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and this is also a, a, a personal thing because uh, there are uh, some singers that have tinnitus and, and they don't care about that. And they say, no, it doesn't matter me, I live with that. But there are singers that are com com completely anxious about that. They feel unsafe, unsecure. They are uh, with uh, a mood and character changes. And, and this is also an emotional problem. That's why in, in, the, in the, what I was giving the conferences in, in the, media about uh, World Hearing Day, I insisted uh, in the prevention because if you have already your training as a singer and you know exactly what kind of uh, uh, situation you are we, uh, singing with, then you feel safe and then you enjoy your singing. Otherwise, you are suffering for singing and not hearing at the same time properly. And that, that makes a very nervous situation for the personality of the artist. Yes, Katrin. Uh, sorry, for, I have a completely different idea in, in, in my brain at the moment. Uh, because was it Ron or was it John who said uh, that um, word hearing day is not that important as uh, word voice day? Um, at the WHO, it's the, it's the opposite. A uh, voice has no voice <laughs> there, and uh, hearing is is big. And last year, uh, it was even done by Guterres, who uh, uh, who launched the World Report on Hearing. So, uh, the Secretary of the United Nations on the World on the World Hearing Day. Uh, so, it, and every year there are many activities. I gave uh, this uh, this. Um, podcast yesterday, but what we can do, uh, oh no, and, and, and another thing, I'm just involved in the uh, WHO rehabilitation program. They found out that in many countries there is nothing such a thing like rehabilitation, for instance, surgical, um, orthopedic, and also he hearing loss rehabilitation. And they now put together um, rehabilitation packages and hearing loss is among them uh, with Cochrane WHO people who seek for, for evidence and now uh, and, and they will be launched this year by the end of this year these um, rehab packages and I proposed to involve voice and I said no voice is not that important nobody dies <laughs> from voice uh, disorder and so, but what we can do as the comment group, and uh, uh, we can upload, I can register for this event at the WHO, we can upload this as a World Hearing Day activity, and then it will be shown after some months on the WHO webpage. They make a report of all the activities. And this would be a good activity where we say link voice, link arts, the sing, singing uh, and artistic TV, voice, artistic voice with hearing loss, please. That would be great. Yes, you know, I, I, I want to comment something is, is, is uh, that uh, I put the, the activities that I organize, I organize with the Foundation of Dogs, I organize about this a conference, an interview that I made about discrimination of the hearing handicapped persons. 
and uh, and we made uh, the another conference about the relation of language hearing, uh, knowledge, and reality. So, what is language for the human being, and why is hearing so important? But of course, also the voice. And it was very difficult to go into the web page of uh, WHO and make the registration. I wanted to make the registration for today for Comet. So if you can make it for us for this, because this is going to be rec this is going to be recorded, and of course it's uh, we are a special group, but of course it is it's interesting for the population, and and so we can organize many things. And I agree with you, Catherine, that uh, our group. Uh, are experts and scientists and uh, artists that can help a lot the world population through the WHO and also to to stay on the importance of the voice because the hearing impaired persons and singers they do have many problems in the voice and we are rehabilitating that the pitch is better that the flexibility is better with the uh, rehabilitation of these uh, hearing handicapped persons because we need quality of the voice we need quality and flexibility of the speech and of the of the language also yes ron uh did you just suggest uh, i just want to be clear about what i just heard you say a piece of it did you just suggest that <clears throat> these meetings that we're having right now the recordings of those meetings should be available to people inside Comet. Well, this, uh, as you as you know, our meetings are in our web page and in our YouTube channel. And of course, we need the uh, the permission from Catherine and from Alan because I record everything. But if you don't give me permission to put it into the YouTube channel or or the Comet web page then I don't put them. For example, Catherine, some of her dogs, uh, was not, she, she didn't want that uh, to give the permission because she needed to publish some data. So yeah. Catherine, I wanted to ask her and Alan, I want to ask him. And of course, this live discussion is for us. Usually it comes on the, on the web page and you can hear everything because we are a, a group and because we are experts and I think this is a way of Comet being present in the world because the expertise that we are all together is not so easy to have. Run. Mm -hmm. uh, but I ask the permission every time I ask permission. Otherwise, I don't publish that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And if, um, if we knew that one of our meetings like this was going to specifically be available to outside groups we would have a different level of discussion i wouldn't try to make stupid jokes with you know with lisa things like that so um forewarning is really important and preparation would be different but i like the idea of any of the recordings be av being available strictly to comet members and then if there's some subset like a talk one of the you know like Martin's talk or Alan's talk um, as a, you know, a little YouTube thing from Comet and the world should see that because they, they think that the world should see that. That's great. That's great. But yeah. the informality uh, and the discussions need to be, uh, otherwise we will inhibit our people in what they say during our discussion. Yes. Okay. I, I, sh I shall take care of all that. And the other thing is, that uh, I would like very much this uh, proposal from Catherine to make it to everybody because uh, I know we have a lot of things to do now we, the world is more open without so much corona but uh, I do think that uh, in our group we can join our uh, efforts and, and make a, a good research about hearing and voice together because as you know, hearing in our group is not so popular. Perhaps some of you have written to me, I cannot talk so much about hearing because I don't do so much hearing. But this is the time that we have to begin making hearing tests. 
and healing procedures and, 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 and to, to think about that. Because the population is getting older and older, the world population, and also our singers, okay, they are not singing anymore, for example, like Alan, he retired from singing, but he's teaching and he needs hearing uh, property, uh, properties in order to make a proper voice teaching. So I think we have to make research more. Mm. Yes, Ron. Well, and you also bring up the question about uh, who all should be in Comet and if it's uh, geared to the performer, uh, but they're all, you know, we don't have too many gastroenterologists, right? Or neurologists, you know, in Comet, right? And so that's what you're talking about as well, expanding um, the expertise who are really interested in the performing voice. But uh, so, you know, the gastroenterologist who sees 50% of the voice clients, you know, and all the subtleties about that. So we have been thinking about expanding membership we're accepting wonderful people like Alan and Lisa, and every time we get together, this happens. But uh, we may want to actually, um, you know, Richard and everybody else deals with a team. And some of those teams um, have dedicated people for the performers, but we need to know more about uh, these other professions. And for example, Catherine brings in great depth relative to auditory processing and all that. And, it's just wonderful to see this. And we all are multidisciplinary and want to learn from our colleagues and blown away by some of these things. So um, I think if we're on the expansion route, then other professions should be considered and, you know, sponsored. Yes, this is a good suggestion. I think, I think this is a point that, that we can discuss. And anyway, I want to invite you uh, if you are interested, of course, it is it is not uh, compulsory, like Comet Zoom meetings are compulsory, but, but not the next one. The next one is to discuss because there have been many of our Comet members interested in, in knowing a little bit more about performing uh, centers, performing art centers. And, and I think if, as Comet, we cannot be uh, like... Uh, like in a company, the company is, is the director and so on. But, but Comet has an, an academical level that it is important. But we cannot control everybody or direct everybody. But we can exchange the ideas. And for example, uh, Dick, Todd, uh, Bob Satalov, uh, Mike Weniger, Diego Kosu, Ron, Lucinda Halstead, Many of our members were interested in, in sharing and exchanging the, the experience they have. For example, Lucinda is the president of uh, Performing Arts Medicine Association. Of course, our concept is completely different because Comet is a closed group. It's a group that you only come by invitation and you have to be accepted from the members of your country and from the members of Comet. Otherwise, you cannot be a Comet member. So we are very strict in this because our bylaws and because we want to, to, to be friendly in a friendly atmosphere. But if you are interested in coming uh, to this Zoom meeting, I shall send the invitation per mail to everybody just that you know exactly what we are talking about. about performing our center in different levels, in different issues. It is very clear for Comet that we are not a commercial institution. We are not interested in commercial situation or in commercial support. We are interested in, in academical development in order to have a, a, a better situation for the artistic voice population. Okay, so my dear, I thank you very much and all your comments are very welcome and uh, i hope you join us in tel aviv because we need to keep on in the world and lively as comet is no easy so we are very very lucky and i thank you very much for your support of being here and i wait for you please we have dates 
and I wait for your payment also uh, because PayPal is already uh, okay. So thank you very see much. you, thank you. Alan, Catherine, Robert, Soledad, Lisa. Remind us. <laughs> <laughs> see you and Hartmut. See you in two minutes, Hartmut. He's my husband. <laughs>